Hey everyone, so I recently watched Earthling Ed's video about Joe Rogan's justifications for hunting. Ed made some good points. He obviously cares a great deal about the environment and the ecosystem, which is great, but I felt that at times focusing on these broader aspects might have undermined the perspective of the individual. There also seems to be a tendency to idealize nature and to see the naturally occurring state as optimal for wild animals. I'm going to point out a few instances in Ed's video where I think this is obvious. I want to clarify here that this is certainly not an attack on Ed. I'm just trying to highlight these issues because I think certain ideas may be harmful. Ed has been a great source of inspiration to me and has certainly influenced my decision to become an activist and to start my own YouTube channel. I really do think he's an exceptional activist and I highly admire, respect and appreciate the work he has done and continues to do for the animals. In fact, I would be flattered if Ed were to watch this video and would be more than happy to have a conversation about the issues I'm going to raise. Before we start, I want to briefly explain why I'm making this video. I became vegan after learning that farmed animals are literally being tortured for the sake of a few moments of sensory pleasure, and it's their pain and misery that motivates me to be an activist. After becoming vegan and learning about animal rights, I started to think about animal ethics more broadly which led me into learning about the lives of wild animals. And it turns out that the lives of most wild animals are filled with pain and misery too. They have to deal with starvation, disease, predation, sexual oppression, accidents. It seems like a very difficult life. The lives of animals in the wild also tend to be extremely short. Infant mortality is the norm. Most of the animals born within the last year are now already dead. Not only are these individuals suffering, but the scale of this suffering is incredibly large. To try and wrap our heads around this, let's get warmed up with some smaller numbers. There are currently around 7.8 billion humans on planet Earth. To give us perspective, let's put this on a number line where 7.8 billion is equal to one inch, or about the width of a quarter. If you stacked up the entire human population on this number line, you would get a line about an inch long. Now let's look at the number of animals living in factory farms right now who are being systematically tortured for meat, dairy and eggs. This is around 114 billion. On the number line, that's about 14 inches or the width of a laptop. 114 billion is in the same ballpark as the total number of humans who have ever lived. Now let's talk about the number of wild vertebrates. Vertebrates are animals with a backbone. This includes mammals, reptiles, birds, amphibians and fish. There are around 10 trillion vertebrates, which on our number line would equate to about 100 feet long or about as long as a basketball court. Okay, let's stop there for a second. Imagine standing on one side of a basketball court, looking up at the net above you and trying to spot on the far end of the basketball court a quarter that's been placed on the floor. That quarter represents the entire number of individual human lives being lived right now and everything in between you and that quarter represents the number of individual vertebrates living in the wild who we know are aware of their lives. The number of sentient individuals living in the wild is mind-boggling. If we then add wildland arthropods, which includes insects like spiders, this adds a further 100,000 trillion animals. And at this point, it's certainly impossible to truly appreciate the number of animals living in the wild. Our brains just aren't capable of comprehending these numbers. On the number line, the number of wild land arthropods takes us from London to Snowdonia. Having learned about the scale and intensity of suffering in the wild, and understanding that we have the potential to do something about it, it became obvious to me that this is one of the most important issues on the planet. And with that said, let's get on with the video. Hunters will kill the strongest animals they can find, the most impressive animals, the animals with the biggest antlers, the strongest animals. But that's not what happens in the wild. Normally, predators will kill the weak and the sick animals. And so actually what Joe's doing is something really dangerous that's having a knock-on effect to the ecology and to the evolution of species. For example, bighorn sheep have seen the size of their horns decrease in the past 30 years. And there are now fewer Asian and African elephants that have tusks. But how does that make sense? 
because these attributes are normally signifiers of a species that is being prosperous, because these attributes would normally be beneficial for those animals. However, in the modern world, these attributes are seen as being detrimental to these animals because it makes them more likely and susceptible to be killed by human hunters. And so actually by hunting these animals, Joe and people like him are doing the opposite of what should be happening in nature. They're creating a transgression in the development of animals rather than a progression. Ed is explicitly stating that what happens naturally in the wild is also what should be happening in the wild. But how are we coming to this conclusion? Well, we could say it should be this way because this is the way it is without human interference. It is simply the way of nature. Of course, as vegan activists, we spend a lot of time pointing out the appeal to nature fallacies that non-vegans make when attempting to justify their consumption of animal products. And so it would be almost ironic to make this argument. For those of you who don't know, an appeal to nature is a logical fallacy that occurs when something is claimed to be good because it's perceived as natural or bad because it's perceived as unnatural. However, there are many naturally occurring things that we consider to be bad, just as there are many unnatural things that we think are good. For example, many diseases occur naturally, and yet as a society, we agree that disease is bad, and we want people who are suffering from disease to receive treatment so they can live as healthy and as happy a life as possible. Ed made the point that in nature, the weak animals are usually the ones who are killed, whereas hunters kill the healthiest and most impressive animals, causing a transgression in the development of animals rather than a progression. However, I think there's something we're forgetting here. Natural selection by evolution will select for traits and individuals that increase the probability of reproductive success. Natural selection does not select for happiness or well-being. As long as a heritable trait increases reproductive success, it's likely to quickly become prevalent in a given population, even if it also has some negative effects for the well-being of individuals. For example, uh, male cats have evolved to have little spikes on their penises. During intercourse, as the penis is withdrawn, the spikes will rake the walls of the feline vagina. This doesn't sound like a very pleasant experience, but it increases the chances of reproductive success in male cats. My point is that natural selection doesn't care about the well-being of individuals. And to me, a progression would refer to an improvement in the well-being of the individuals as opposed to a return to the naturally occurring state. Furthermore, if Joe Rogan decides to only hunt and kill the weak, sick, or very young animals, would this lead to a progression in the development of animals? Would you still not have a moral issue with this approach? I'm assuming most of you would, and yet paradoxically, many people would have no issue if rather than Joe Rogan, we introduced a pack of wolves to hunt and kill the exact same animals. The natural ecology is suffering as a consequence of what these hunters are doing. I understand what Ed means here, but I don't think it's helpful to talk about abstract concepts as if they can suffer. I think it highlights the focus on the ecosystem as opposed to the individual who does have the capacity to suffer. Many environmentalists talk about the ecosystem and the planet as if they had intrinsic value. Well, the ecosystem cannot suffer. Only the individuals within it can. And that's precisely why our focus needs to be on the individual animals as opposed to the ecosystem or the planet. But to truly address the overpopulation argument that Joe and other hunters make, we have to look at the root cause of the problem. I mean, why is it that we now exist in a world where we do have overpopulation of certain species of animals? Because that shouldn't happen naturally. It only happens when there's something taken place that's destabilized the natural world. Imagine a species consuming vegetation without any interference from human beings. During a time of plenty, the number of individuals will grow. In fact, the number of individuals can grow to a point where there are too many individuals to survive, given the resources available. When this happens, death by starvation will inevitably occur. As Richard Dawkins pointed out in his book, River Out of Eden, if there is ever a time of plenty, this very fact will automatically lead to an increase in population until the natural state of starvation and misery is restored. If human beings reproduce to the point where our environment wasn't providing enough resources to feed everyone, we would certainly call this an issue of overpopulation. This is exactly what's happening in the wild. These animals are in a constant swing between increases and decreases in population size, which is being regulated by available resources and dangers such as predation and disease. We can still call this an issue of overpopulation, even if the population size is being naturally regulated by natural processes such as the scarcity of food. 
if we actually cared about conservation, protecting population sizes of animals in the natural world, then the single biggest thing that we can do is eliminate animal farming. Should our goal be to protect the population sizes of animals? I care about how each individual animal is doing within that population. I don't place any intrinsic value on an increase or decrease or stabilization of population size. Many environmentalists seem to think that a species is prospering if they are large in number. And while that may certainly be true, if you define prospering as being large in number and safe from extinction, but by that reasoning, chickens have been extremely prosperous due to the development of factory farming. In other words, I think it would be better for the animals if conservationists and environmentalists shifted their focus from the level of the species to the level of the individual. Let's not primarily focus on how to best preserve ecosystems, but shift our focus on how to make the lives of the individuals living within them better. That frees up about 50% of the US straight away. And with that land, what we can do is reforest and rewild that land, provide habitats and homes for the wild animals. And we can also trophically rewild as well. Trophically rewilding is where we introduce natural animals back into those ecosystems Predators, for example. I think the idea of controlling the population sizes of animals by introducing other animals to eat them alive is not only extremely cruel, but also difficult to hold consistently if you consider yourself non-speciesist. I think it's useful to put this into a human context. So let's do a little thought experiment. Imagine a tribe of indigenous people who are cut off from the rest of civilization. Let's further assume that there have previously been bears around who would occasionally eat some of the children and therefore the population size was kept in check. But now due to humans hunting these bears to extinction, the population size of the tribe is getting out of control. How would you feel about reintroducing bears to hunt them down and eat them alive as a means of population control? If we're not willing to accept this in a human context, then why would we accept this in a non-human context? Isn't this a textbook example of speciesism? Clearly, there are other options to control population sizes, such as different contraceptive measures that don't entail someone being eaten alive. This idea of reintroducing animals to eat wild animals alive is not only unbelievably cruel, but something that would fill us with sheer terror if we were doing it to humans rather than non-humans. And this happened in Yellowstone National Park. In Yellowstone, you're not allowed to hunt. But what happened in the 20th century is that hunters killed all the wolves because they wanted to hunt the elk themselves. Now, without the wolves, the elk population started to increase. And because the elk population increased, they started having a negative impact on the wildlife and the ecology of Yellowstone. So what happened is they introduced wolves back into Yellowstone National Park. And lo and behold, through doing so, it balanced out the population sizes of animals within Yellowstone and has now created a much healthier ecosystem and environment as a result. I understand that there are now more animals in Yellowstone and more diversity across species, but is this what we should care about? Do we value the health of the ecosystem over the well-being of the individuals living within it? From my perspective, the important question is this. Is there more or less suffering as a result of the intervention at Yellowstone? This is an empirical question and we haven't got the data to take a confident stance, but what's clear to me is that we need to stop talking about the ecosystem as if it's sentient and start talking about improving the lives of the individuals living within it. And that's what we should be striving to do on a larger scale. Take away the problem, the root cause of the problem, reintroduce animals, restore the natural world and allow nature to do its thing because it's done its thing for millennia and it's always working out just about right. But then humans come in and we mess it all up and then think that we have to be the ones to take the guns and rifles to try and restore the natural world again. Whether or not nature has done its thing for millennia is completely irrelevant to whether we should allow it to continue. I was surprised to see Ed make an appeal to tradition because he spends a large amount of time debunking the appeal to tradition fallacies that non-vegans make when attempting to justify their consumption of animal products. Just because something has always happened, this does not mean that it is good or desirable or that it should continue happening. Ed says that we should allow nature to do its thing because it's always working out just about right. But who's it working out right for? It certainly wasn't working out right for humans. Or was it? 
I mean, if it was, why did we create schools and hospitals and social care and homes to live in? I find it interesting that for us, creating an unnatural civilization is a good thing. And yet when it comes to wild animals, we seem to have this completely unjustified belief that the way things occur naturally also happens to be the optimal state for their well-being. And any movement away from this natural state must be a bad thing. It's understandable that humans nowadays might get the impression that nature is always working out just about right. Most of us are shielded from all of the unpleasant things in nature. We are sitting in our warm, comfy homes, occasionally finding pleasure in the beauty of nature when we go on a long walk in the forest or watch a David Attenborough documentary. Due to our current relationship with nature, we have reason to believe that our perception of it is positively skewed, which is why we vastly underestimate the amount of suffering occurring in the wild. However, no amount of David Attenborough documentaries justifies allowing animals to experience intense suffering if we can help. I believe that within the vegan activist community especially, there is a tendency to idealize nature and the lives of the animals living within it. I mean, these are the animals who are free, right? They're free from enslavement, free from the tyranny of human beings. But make no mistake, this does not mean that their lives are free from suffering. In fact, we have reason to believe that the lives of most wild animals are largely filled with misery. And you can find out more about this by watching my original video on the topic, The Vegan Blind Spot, or watching my discussion with Alex O'Connor, aka Cosmic Skeptic, both of which you can find in the Wild Animal Suffering playlist on my channel. I also recommend checking out an online talk by Cameron Mayer, Deputy Director at the non-profit organization Wild Animal Initiative. There's also a very informative lecture series on the Animal Ethics YouTube channel. If you're looking to learn more about the dangers faced by animals living in the wild, then this is a series you should definitely watch. I'm going to put the links to both of these in the description and the comment section of my video. To sum up, I think that rather than at the level of the species or the ecosystem, our primary focus should be at the level of the individual. The ecosystem and the species are concepts and are not sentient entities in themselves. Individuals are the ones who can suffer. They are the ones that matter. Their suffering matters. It matters to them and it should matter to us. If you find my content valuable, please do consider supporting me on Patreon. August Patreon of the Month Award goes to Dr. Kin Tsui, and I hope I pronounced your name correctly there, apologies if not, but you've won my copy of In Defense of Animals by Peter Singer. Enjoy. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll speak soon.